This week we are doing chapter 12 on the water cycle um, and other water resources. The water cycle, of course, is review from elementary school, so we'll just spend a short time on it, uh, but it does lead us into other things about freshwater resources that we need. So yesterday you should have labeled and defined these things on your water cycle picture. So let's take a look and make sure you have the correct answers. So your water cycle picture, most of you drew it for yourself. And these are the kind of details you need in it. You have some mountains and a body of water, like an ocean. And so starting right here, evaporation is going to be water going from a liquid to a gas. Pretty simple. Water evaporates from the oceans, lakes, goes from a liquid to a gas, turns into water vapor, uh, which is humidity in the air. And so one of the questions that you were supposed to answer yesterday was something like, how does water get into the atmosphere? And many people answered it very simply and just said evaporation. Uh, it is because the sun is shining on it and it heats up. So therefore, the water gets into the air as water vapor. And then, as that water gets higher and higher up in the air, how does the temperature change as you go up in the atmosphere? It gets colder. And so at cooler temperatures, the air cannot hold as much moisture, and it turns into clouds. And so condensation is the water going from, a, from water vapor in the air to liquid, which is teeny tiny little droplets in clouds. So then up here, we'll have condensation. And I noticed as I was looking over your water cycle pictures for many of you, that you copied the definition straight out of the book, which on one hand is fine. And on the other hand, I'm going to say going from a liquid to a gas, going from a gas to a liquid in clouds. And if you have it word for word out of the textbook, just make sure that you recognize it as the same thing. Because the textbook definition is a little too sciencey and maybe not making sense in everyday language. So then we have condensation into clouds. Now at some point, those water droplets, those tiny bits of water in the clouds, they get big enough and stick together enough that they no longer can stay up in the clouds um, as this liquid in the in the clouds, and so then they fall out in precipitation. Precipitation is how the water is getting back from the clouds, from the air, back onto the ground. So precipitation, of course, are things like rain, snow, fog, hail, sleet. All of those things are types of precipitation. The water falls back to the earth. Then the other things that we have to add to our water cycle are things like runoff, which is kind of self-explanatory. Enough water pools together, or the snow melts, or whatever, and it goes into lakes and rivers. And we'll talk a little bit tomorrow about watersheds and that sort of thing. We also have something else you need to know is groundwater. Groundwater includes um, the water that has gone, uh, been absorbed. The video, we, the brain pop called it infiltrating, but basically it permeates into the ground and collects in aquifers and becomes groundwater, which is used by plants and trees or is just collected there. So those are the major parts. Hang on just a second. I have another water cycle picture we can look at here. Maybe this one. And so this one is showing the same thing just in a little bit more detail, but lakes, streams, vegetation, soils, this is going to be evaporation, of course. Here in condensation, it turns into clouds. And then we have precipitation. And somebody yesterday said, oh no, I think the arrows in my circle are going the wrong way. It doesn't really matter as long as you have these things happening. So there you have surface runoff. You have groundwater down here. 
you have it permeating down. You've got lakes and rivers and runoff and stuff like that. Okay? Questions about that? The next thing I wanted to talk about was the rest of those questions that I had you answer yesterday talked about um, where we find water on Earth. And it's really important, I think, and the textbook mentions it so briefly that I wanted to kind of highlight this and spend a little more time on it. So one of the questions said, what are the four major sources of water on Earth? And they are, anybody? <clears throat> so the four major sources of water on Earth, places we find water are oceans, ice, lakes and rivers, and groundwater. And then the second part of that question, which I thought was worded a little bit confusingly, was of these four major sources of water, which ones are salt water? Of all of these, which ones are salt water? Oceans. Only oceans. Uh, oceans and salt lakes. But here's the interesting thing. So the surface of the Earth, 70% of the surface of the Earth is covered with water. We need water. All living things have to have water to survive. But 97% of the water on Earth is salt water, mostly in oceans and a little bit in salt lakes. Can we use that water to drink? Can we use it to water plants? No. So plants and animals can't use salt water. It will kill us. It is so salty. Have you ever gotten a mouthful of seawater? It's, it's so salty, it actually dehydrates you. Yes. So you can desalinate it. You can boil it to purify it. And that actually is a pretty useful way of, of purifying water. The problem is it takes a long time and it takes a lot of energy. It takes a huge amount of energy to boil water. So yes, we can do that, but it's not a very effective way of doing it. So for the most part, the salt water in the oceans and salt lakes is not really available for us to use. Um, so then we've got this other 3%. You're like, okay, well, there's a lot of water on Earth. We've got 3% of the water on Earth that is fresh water. That water is broken down into these categories. Interestingly, most of the fresh water on Earth is ice, in ice caps and glaciers and sea ice. Can we use that to drink and water our crops? If you melt it. But guess what? Now we've got the same problem. You have to use fuel to melt it, and it takes a lot of energy and a lot of time to melt it. So we can't really use this usefully. Okay, how about shallow groundwater? Can we use that for drinking and watering crops? Yes. This is groundwater in aquifers. Shallow groundwater means it is shallow enough that we can drill down a well and pump it up. This is the way much of Colorado gets its water from shallow groundwater, from aquifers. Um, there's a limited amount, but it's how many, many places get their uh, drinking water. How about deep groundwater? Can we use that? Actually, yeah, actually it's deep because it's really too deep to effectively pump down and get it out with a well and a pump. It's also harder to locate because it's so deep. How about lakes and rivers? Can we use that for drinking and irrigation and living things? Yeah. Yes. Okay. How about the humidity in the air? Can we use that for watering plants? And that? No, not really. In areas where there's a lot of humidity, your irrigation and your plants and that will maybe need less water. But um, yeah, so we have this problem. So when you look at this, of all of the water on Earth, only 3% is fresh water. And of that fresh water, most of it's ice. And so we have a very limited amount of water that we can use. So is water a rene renewable resource? Kind of, but it is very, depending on where you live, it's very easy to use the water faster than you, uh, faster than it replenishes itself through the water cycle. The other thing to think of, I took a class this summer on um, water in the West. Here in Colorado, we, um, it's, a very, it's a relatively dry area. We depend on rain, we depend on snow, the melting snowpack to provide water for us. Uh, there are some aquifers, but it's a limited amount of water. So, Sometimes when there's drought, we are have watering restrictions. We think about using water for, you know, 
swimming pools and watering our lawns and drinking and all watering crops. But here's the other interesting thing that people oftentimes forget. Where do we get most of our electricity? How do we get electricity from water? We do get it from hydroelectric, although hydroelectric is not using up the water. That actually works pretty well. How do we get it? Coal burning plants is how most of the United States gets our electricity. But you burn the coal, which boils water, which makes steam, which makes the turbines turn and generates electricity. So it turns out that for most of us in the United States, when we use electricity, it actually also uses water. Can re we recycle some of that water? Yes. You can recapture it. You can reuse it. You can reboil it. You keep it in holding ponds. But if you've just boiled that water, fish can't live in it, so it has to be a special holding pond. But we forget that all of our electricity use, like for running air conditioners, um, those sorts of things also use a lot of water. So it's just something we need to think about as you read the rest of the chapter about groundwater and water resources and water pollution. It's actually really a pretty big deal. So that's it for this. We'll do another quick flip lesson tomorrow. And now you're going to do the rest of the chapter.